Angels are saying to you, a big sum of money is coming into your bank account very soon. Good news is coming your way. It will be a sign for you that despite everything that's happened recently, you are now on the right path. Save this post to affirm. Tomorrow morning, you will wake up with $100,000 in your bank account affirm, yes. Three days from now, you will clearly understand. That delay in your plan was the protection of God, His love. He is near to you, all the time. He is guiding you, here and now. This sign is clear. Some kind of miracle will happen to you before the end of this week. You'll manifest something you have been waiting on. Be ready to receive. This is going to be the biggest month of your life with several quantum leaps in your reality. Welcome these abundant shifts with a constant expression of gratitude for the journey you have been on. Very good things are about to happen for you. You chose to go a different direction than the masses. You chose to be unique and to celebrate your differences. The universe is showering you with blessings as a result of the good decisions you are making. You are shedding layers of outdated programming and clearing generational karma. A wave of positive momentum is behind you. Continue to step out of your comfort zone daily. You are fully committed. You went all in. Sure, you made some mistakes along the way, but give yourself credit for doing what most were afraid to even try. If people are laughing at you or judging you, it's probably a good sign. You weren't afraid to do it differently. You are a unique soul, and sometimes your unique expression may not be understood. Don't ever let someone or society dampen your light. You were put on this earth to shine. You have come so far from when you started your journey to become the best version of yourself. Give yourself credit for the risks you've taken and the growth you've experienced. You are thriving. The month of April is going to be a big month for you. The month of April is going to be very romantic. You're overflowing with joy, love, and understanding. April is going to be extraordinarily awesome. When you approach me in stillness and in trust, you are strengthened. You need a buffer zone of silence around you in order to focus on things that are unseen. Since I am invisible, you must not let your senses dominate your thinking. The curse of this age is overstimulation of the senses, which blocks out awareness of the unseen world. The tangible world still reflects my glory. To those who have eyes that see and ears that hear. Spending time alone with me is the best way to develop seeing eyes and hearing ears. The goal is to be aware of unseen things even as you live out your life in the visible world. Remember that you live in a fallen world, an abnormal world tainted by sin. Much frustration and failure result from your seeking perfect tie-in in this life. There is nothing perfect in this world except me. That is why closeness to me satisfies deep yearnings and fills you with joy. I have planted longing for perfection in every human heart. This is a good desire which I alone can fulfill. But most people seek this fulfillment in other people and earthly pleasures or achievements. Thus they create idols, before which they bow down. I will have no other gods before me. Make me the deepest desire of your heart. Let me fulfill your yearning for perfection. Be willing to follow my lead, beloved. Open yourself more fully to me and my way for you. Don't get so focused on what you want that you miss the things I've prepared for you. Relax with me while I transform you by the renewal of your mind, working my newness into your innermost being. Trust me enough to let go of your expectations and demands. Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes you obstruct the very things you desire by trying too hard to make things go according to your will and timing. 
I know the desires of your heart, and I also know the best way to reach those goals. Instead of striving to be in control so you can get what you want, seek my face. Talk with me openly and rest for a while in my presence. When you are feeling more refreshed, invite me to show you the way forward. I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim me. The word acclaim means to express enthusiastic approval. This is not the natural inclination of mankind. It is something you need to learn and practice. Begin with your thoughts. Instead of thinking of me in boring, repetitive ways, ponder my glorious greatness. I spoke the world into existence. I formed people in my own image and gave them eternal souls. I care beauty in the world and throughout the universe. I am infinitely more brilliant than the greatest genius imaginable. My wisdom is unsearchable, and my love is unfailing. Learn to think great thoughts of me and to express them enthusiastically. The Psalms provide excellent instruction in this quest. To acclaim me also means to acknowledge my excellence publicly. You are the light of the world because you know me as your Savior God. I want you to let your light shine before men. Tell them the wonders of who I am and all I have done. Proclaim the excel of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I draw near you in the present moment. Seek to enjoy my presence in the present. Trust and thankful. Ness are your best allies in this quest. When you wallow in the past or worry about the future, your awareness of me grows dim. But the more you trust me, the more fully you can live in the present, where my presence awaits you always. Speak to me frequently. I trust you, Jesus. I love you, O Lord, my strength. These short prayers keep you close to me, confident that I'm lovingly watching over you. It's important for you to grow not only more trusting, but more thankful. A grateful attitude is essential for living near me. Ingratitude is offensive to me, and it drags you down both spiritually and emotionally. Remember that you are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, no matter what is happening in your life or in the world. This means that you have a constant, unshakable reason to be thankful. Stay anchored to me and enjoy my presence by giving thanks in all circumstances. I give you joy in your journey through the world. This sparkling gift is not a luxury, it's a necessity. There are bumps in the road ahead, as well as sharp curves, ascents, and descents. Without joy in your heart, you will become weary and discouraged. Joy is not dependent on the circumstances in your life. It can transcend them all. This is why impoverished people are often more joyful than those who have material wealth. Sick and even dying, people can also be joyful when they're trusting in me as Savior, Lord, and friend. Seek to spread joy in the world around you. Let my light reflect from your demeanor, through your smiles, your laughter, your words. The Holy Spirit will equip you to do this as you give Him space in your life. Ask Him to fill you with contagious delight. Concentrate on staying close to me, and I will lead you along the path of life. In my presence, there is fullness of joy. Somewhere along your journey as a Christian, you need to learn to die to yourself regularly. It saves you from being defensive, irritable, revengeful, retaliatory, unfriendly, mean, and spiteful, accumulating the list of things against you. When you are forgotten, neglected, overlooked, or purposely set aside, when you are hurt by the insult or oversight, Still, your heart is happy, and you count it a privilege to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self, when your good is spoken off in an evil way. 
when you are misunderstood, when your desires are not being met, when your advice is disregarded and your opinions and ideas are ridiculed, when you are persecuted and mistreated, and you refuse to let anger and hatred rise in your heart that is dying to self, when you lovingly, patiently bear any disruption, any irregularity, any annoyance, any inconvenience, when you can stand face to face with the above and endure it as Jesus endured it, that is dying to self. When you can live content with any food, any clothes, any climate, any society, any interruption, or any solitude, that is dying to self. When you never consider to refer to yourself in a conversation or to record and recite your own good works or to pursue honor and commendation, when you can truly love to be unrecognized for something good, that is dying to self. When you see someone else prosper, someone else reaches the goals that you desire. When you can honestly rejoice with that person in spirit, feeling no jealousy and not questioning God, even while your needs are far greater and in desperate circumstances, that is dying to self. When you can receive correction and reproof and humbly submit inwardly and outwardly, feeling no rebellion and feeling no resentment rising within your heart, that is dying to self. To constantly deny yourself is a great spiritual challenge. But that's what God calls for. For those who would give up their lives for His sake would eternal life. Life is full of things to chase. Money, fame, things that will fill you for a moment, but never satisfy. When I reflect back on my own life and the former pursuit of those things, I realize I was like a zombie. I was living for the things of the flesh. But that's not the end of the story. God called me, woke me, and gave me a new purpose. He gives us something to chase that will always fulfill, always satisfy, and never fail Him. In Romans 8, the scriptures explain that a mind focused on flesh leads to death, but a mind focused on what the Spirit desires gives life and peace. What is your mind focused on? What do you chase? When your thoughts wander, do you dwell on the things of the Lord, or is it consumed by the numbers in your bank account, the new shoes you want, or what people think of you? God came, took on our sinful flesh, and paid the price owed for our sins. We no longer have to be controlled by the flesh, but can choose to follow the Spirit. Did you know a person can have 20-20 vision and yet be nearsighted spiritually? That's what happens when some, one pursues short-term desires instead of the qualities God values. Faith, virtue, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Biblical stories about spiritually short-sighted people caution us against sacrificing future blessings for more immediate gratification. Take Saul, for instance. He was Israel's first king, but when he decided his way was better than God's, the Lord took his kingdom away and gave it to David. And sadly, David himself is another example. He had been faithful for many years, but in a moment of weakness made a devastating choice. His desire for Bathsheba led him to commit both adultery and murder. Although he repented and was forgiven, the consequences of his sin impacted the rest of his life. To avoid the kind of mistakes these men made, we need to prioritize God's long-term goals for us. In other words, we must cherish the eternal over the temporal and strengthen our faith with godly virtues. Anyone who wants to live in the radical, outrageous, chase you down, the street and overtake you blessings of God has to do something to receive them. 
we must realize that the blessing package described in Deuteronomy 28.1.14 is conditional. It comes from a willingness to obey God whether He tells us to do something in our heart or in His Word. If we struggle with why God isn't blessing us, it may be because God has already told us the things we need to do to get our life in order and to receive the radical blessings. We really don't need to whine and complain about doing what God tells us to do because anything that He tells us to do, He gives us the ability to do. The problem may be that we just haven't done what He has told us to do. Perhaps more than ever we need to get up and get going, moving forward in obedience to God. If you desire things to be any different, you're going to have to believe in yourself and your purpose. Until you believe in your gift, your message, your blessings and your greatness, things won't change. Your reality is ultimately a reflection of what you believe is possible for you and what you believe you're currently limited to. Until you believe in yourself, your belief in lack and limitation will continue to create your reality and your results. Self-belief changes everything. Believe in the possibility of things getting better. Train yourself to believe in yourself and your blessings instead of believing in your limitations and failures. Learn to block out the noise, negativity, and doubt of others. Stay focused upon your own positive mindset. Don't need other people to see, believe, or understand what you can see. They can't see your dream. They weren't supposed to. They don't know what you know. They can only ever see your dream from their limited perspective. It looks very different to them. Don't need other people to believe in you or that which you do for you to believe in yourself. Encourage and empower yourself. Think of your thoughts as being notifications, like those that you receive on your phone. Your brain, the notification system, will naturally bring a thought into your awareness for you to see it and then deal with it. However, at times that signal can be broken, causing the same notification to reappear on a loop. Recognize those reappearing thoughts as being that broken notification system. When those thoughts reappear, simply acknowledge, accept, and allow them, and then refocus. By accepting those thoughts, you're not accepting what they're saying. You're simply acknowledging the broken notification system. In time, with help, that notification system will slowly begin to correct itself. Are you still waiting for permission to be great? Don't need someone else to push you to achieve greatness. If you're waiting for their support or to be told that you're good enough, then you'll be waiting forever. Let go of the story that no one supported me or that no one cared. That story is exactly what is stopping you from growing and reaching your highest potential now. Allow yourself to be great challenge and encourage yourself. Remind yourself daily of your worth, talent, and greatness. It's no one else's responsibility but yours. What motivates you to get up in the morning, to go to work, to study hard, to serve and give and love others, to keep going when life gets stressful? If you don't want to be fighting stress all the time, you need to know your deepest motivation. Why is that? Because mixed motivations will leave you feeling like you're being pulled in different directions. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Luke 16, 13. Even God can't please everybody. When somebody's praying for it to rain, someone else is praying for it to be sunny. People will most often be disappointed because people have different expectations. You can't please everyone. The Bible says the fear of man is a trap. It will capture your heart and mind and cause you to stumble. That's why Jesus said in John 5.30, I am not trying to do what I want, but only what he who sent me wants. 
Jesus knew who he was trying to please. If you're not trying to please God, then in all likelihood, you're trying to please a bunch of people. It's a lot easier and less stressful to decide you're going to please God, because whatever you do that pleases God will always be the right thing. This is why Jesus was so stress-resistant. He was only trying to please one person. Whose approval are you depending on for your happiness? Who are you still trying to please? For some, it's a parent who never showed approval or encouragement. For others, it may be a boss who's impossible to please, no matter how hard you try. But you are not a victim. You are as free as you choose to be. Nobody can pressure you into meeting their expectations without your permission. When you live for an audience of one, you won't be controlled by the fear of rejection. Instead, you'll be motivated by love and free to be the person God made you to be. His brothers were jealous because he was their favorite son. So they sold Joseph into slavery. He was taken to Egypt, and for the first 40 years of his life, everything went wrong. He was sold into slavery, falsely accused of rape, and thrown in jail for a crime he didn't commit. For 40 years, nothing seemed to go right for Joseph, but God put Joseph exactly where he wanted him to be. He knew that Joseph would be raised up to become the second most powerful leader in Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And because of that, Joseph was able to save Egypt and Israel from famine. Not only did he save two nations from starvation, but he also saved his family, the ones who sold him into slavery. When his brothers appeared before him, Joseph could have confronted them and punished them for what they did to him. But what was Joseph's attitude toward his brothers? He treated them with grace, not bitterness. He was able to do that because he saw God's greater perspective and purpose. He knew God could use even the biggest hurts in our lives for good. Joseph said to his brothers, You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Genesis 50, 20. God took the terrible sin of Joseph's brothers and used it to eventually save many people. There will always be people in your life who have bad intentions, who will resent you, criticize you, and hurt you. There will be times when you are the innocent victim of someone else's sin. There is no way around it. You may not understand it, but you don't have to. You can trust that God sees, He cares, and He will have justice. Like Joseph, maybe you can't change your circumstances, and maybe you're wondering how you're going to make it through or what God is doing. God can use everything, good or bad, to accomplish His purposes, His good plan to grow your character and make you more like Jesus will not be changed by other people. What others intend for bad, he will use good. Set me before you continually. Keep your eyes on me. I am at your right hand, close by your side. This is the most reliable source of joy, knowing that I am always near. Seek to strengthen your awareness of my presence so you can enjoy me in your moments and feel more secure. Communicating with me in silent prayers, in whispers, in spoken words, in shouts of praise is the best way to stay attentive to me. I want you to be real with me in your prayers. Instead of worrying or obsessing about things, turn those thoughts toward me. Talk with me about whatever is on your mind. I will show you my way to handle the person or situation that concerns you. Study and meditate on scripture. Let it saturate your heart and mind, changing your way of thinking. Permeate your prayers with biblical concepts and content. As you stay in close communication with me, the joy of my presence is yours. 
Satan is a coward. All you have to do is go to God. Don't let Satan take over your life. Submit to God and resist when you feel like you are being tempted. Follow the examples of Jesus. We must surrender our own battles and our own plans to achieve our desires because God has the perfect plan. Quit the path of the world and resist the devil. He then will run away from us. Don't let sin control you. Put all your faith in God. Once you let God into your life, you will realize how truly wonderful he is. Submitting to God means coming under his authority. Rather than living according to our own desires and ways of living, we should submit those things to God and live according to his desires and standards. We must first recognize that his ways are better than ours. We must recognize that he knows better than we do. We must also believe that he has our best intentions in mind. He cares for us. Resist the devil. The devil desires to keep us from our relationship with God and cause us to stray from God. When we resist him, God's strength will flee from us. What is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. A counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that, should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. An idol has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy, your emotional and financial resources, on it without a second thought. An idol is whatever you look at and say, in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning, then I'll know I have value, then I'll feel significant and secure. If anything in life becomes more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning in life and identity, then it is an idol. What you believe is what you will experience. If you believe there is no magic in life, then you'll never experience it. If you believe the miraculous is not real, then you'll never accept it, even if you encounter it. If you believe you're limited in what you can do, accomplish and become, then you'll always live within the confines of your imagination. However, the opposite is also true. If you believe in magic, you'll experience it around every corner. If you believe in the miraculous, then you'll train yourself to see and be thankful for the small miracles that unfold each day. If you believe you are limitless, then you'll see that anything you imagine is possible. The beliefs you hold on to influence your life significantly, ultimately determining how your story unfolds. An honest man was being tailgated by a stressed out woman on a busy boulevard. Suddenly, the light turned yellow just in front of him. He did the right thing, stopping at the crosswalk, even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. The tailgating woman hit the roof, and the horn, screaming in frustration as she missed her chance to get through the intersection. As she was still in mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered her to exit her car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, and photographed, and then placed in a holding cell. After a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, flipping off the guy in front of you, and cursing a blue streak at him. I noticed the, what would Jesus do? bumper sticker, the follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker, and the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. One day Jesus and his disciples saw a man who had been blind since he was born. 
This man had never seen his parents or looked at the sky, trees, or birds. He did not even know what his own face looked like. In times long ago, many people thought that if someone had an illness, disease, or any bad thing happened to them, that is, was because they or their parents had committed a temple sin. But Jesus wanted his friends to know that this man's blindness was not the result of his parents' sins or his sin. Jesus said this man was bomb-blind, so God might do something amazing in him. Jesus also said he was the light of the world. So, we have a man who has never seen light, only darkness. And here was Jesus who was the light of the world. What do you think Jesus is going to do? Jesus didn't make mud cookies or bricks, did he? What did Jesus do with the mud? Pause for responses. Yes, Jesus spread it over the blind man's eyes. That sounds really strange, but Jesus also told the man to go and wash in a pool called Salome. The man did what Jesus said and was suddenly healed. Remember, Jesus said, he was the light of the world. Jesus brought light to this man by helping him to see. The blind man did not live in darkness anymore. Can just anyone use mud to make a blind person see? No, only Jesus could have done that. That's because Jesus is God and can heal anyone. One of the greatest reasons why prayer isn't answered among Christians is unforgiveness. Jesus gave his disciples a command to forgive, and then he told them plainly that if they did not forgive, neither would their Father in heaven forgive them their failings and shortcomings. He was blunt with them because he knew what a stumbling block unforgiveness would be for their spiritual life. It is important to note that forgiveness and having faith to move mountains comes in the same context. There is no power in speaking to a mountain if the heart is full of unforgiveness. Yet this problem is rampant among God's children. If there is anything that will short-circuit God from answering our prayers, it's a heart full of unforgiveness and bitterness toward others. You can't go into your prayer closet and expect God to move mountains for you or on behalf of others when you've hardened your heart with unforgiveness. Extend abundant mercy and forgiveness just as God forgave you in Christ. An important part of never giving up is making right choices while you are hurting, discouraged, frustrated, confused, or under pressure. The right choice is often the harder choice. And when we're in the middle of terrible stress, we naturally want to take the path of least. But those are exactly the moments when you need to discipline yourself to make the tougher choice. In order to reap right results in life, you have to do right when you do not feel like it. I call this pressing in and pressing on, and knowing how to do it is one of the most impor components of becoming a person who never gives up. You will never get where you want to be in life without being willing to sacrifice and push through the and adversities that stand in your way. Your obstacle may be an attitude, a set of circumstances, a relationship, an issue from your past, a thought or mindset, a feeling, or a bad habit. Whatever it is, you are the only one who can press through it. No one else can do your pressing for you. You may have tried to overcome your challenges in the past. Perhaps you have tried to the point that you are weary, exhausted, or discouraged. This is precisely the point where you have to summon fresh strength from God and press in one more time. One of the definitions I like for the word press is to exert steady force or pressure against something. I often say, you have to press against the pressure that's pressing you. When something is pressing against you, you must. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 8, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. People don't talk about being pure in heart, but we do use the word integrity. To have integrity does not mean you are perfect, 
because if it did, none of us would have it. So what does it mean to have integrity? Integrity is wholeness. Many people think of their life like a pizza, and the different parts of their life are the slices. This slice is my career. This is my work life, my spiritual life, my family life, my social life. Then over here is my secret life, my compulsions, addictions, and the things nobody else knows about. If you segment your life like that, you lack integrity, because your life is not a wall. Integrity means you're the same person with everybody, in your speech, actions, and motives. No matter which part of life you're dealing with, integrity is authenticity. During plays in ancient Greek culture, there was one guy who would play multiple roles. He would come on stage wearing a mask, go backstage to put on a different mask to play another role. This person was called the A, and it's where we get the word hypocrite. When you wear masks so that you appear one way in front of some people and another way for others, it shows a lack of authenticity. God wants you to be exactly who he made you to be, no matter who is watching. Integrity is unmixed motivation. It means you do the right thing, and you do it for the right reason. You have unmixed motivation and pure motives. You're sincere and straightforward in every area of your life and with all people. You pray to talk to God and not to impress others. We're interested in image, but God is interested in integrity. We're interested in reputation, but God is interested in character. Reputation is what everybody thinks you are. Integrity is what you really are. Reputation is what you are in public. Integrity is what you are when you're all alone. And she called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her. Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seethe me? Genesis 16 and 13. KJV. Hagar experienced fear and isolation when she fled in desperation to the desert. There she came to know God as the one who truly saw her and saved her and her son Ishmael. God hears us. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou hearest my voice. Jonah 2.2 KJV When we endure suffering, it can be hard to feel that God is near. And yet from the isolation of the whale's belly, Jonah cried out to God and God heard. God is listening to you today. God is with us. Yea. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23, 4, KJV. Whatever you are facing today, you need not fear, for God is present even in the darkest valleys. We can look to God when we're helpless and confused, neither know we what to do but our eyes are upon thee. The particular challenges we each face in our personal life may leave us helpless and confused, and we may not know what to do. And yet in the midst of chaos, we fix our eyes on God, who is always reliable. We can choose to trust God. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Habakkuk 3, 17-19, KJV Despite all the fearful circumstances we face, we can choose daily to put our trust in God, for He is faithful. We can choose to release our fears to God, 
casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Many of us today are carrying a heavy load, health worries, employment insecurity, financial concerns, care for vulnerable members, and so much more. Release every anxiety to God. God is still the author of surprising solutions. The cruelty of mankind can disturb them to the core, but in the midst of their play-acting, they might convince themselves that they're unaffected by it. It's no doubt that most 12th house Neptune people learn to develop very thick skins. They feel like they have to in order to survive. So, it can be common for those with this placement to appear to be the least victimized. On the surface, that is. On the inside, they are very tormented by the pain of others, to the point where they might disassociate from it. Neptune in the twelfth house feels like everyone else is so fragile and so vulnerable. They are very affected by people who are hurt, lost, confused, or rejected. But they can fail to realize or admit just how incredibly fragile and vulnerable they themselves are. Their high sensitivity seems to magnify the pain of others. Failing to accept this sensitivity makes things worse. People with Neptune in this house, therefore, victimize themselves through their denial and their constant disguise. Wearing. They can desperately assume whatever role is needed in order to survive the world and not be crushed by it, especially if Neptune is conjunct their ascendant. But this can cause a rising break from reality to the point where they no longer know what or who is real anymore. This is why Neptune in the twelfth house can be so intent on burrowing themselves in what's not real, the make-believe land of movies, books, or other endless fantasies. Therefore, these people's self-victimization can be deeply private and inward, more so than other twelfth house folks. Escape is a particular tool of undoing, whether it's through isolation, delusion, or addiction. Mental and emotional breakdowns are commonly experienced with this position, even though many people subscribe our YouTube channel to reach 30,000 divine subscribers. Please help us by sharing this video to 100 people, only if you love God and share us super thanks. Thanks for watching.